<laughs> MSU Web Accessory Policy. See <laughs> what kind of makes sense. Uh, I'm Mike Allage. I'm the Associate Director of what's now called Usability Slash Accessibility Research and Consulting instead of UAC. And this is Christine Moore, who's from our Office of uh, Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives. That's right. Can you all hear me? Is this working? No. Is it turned on? Probably not. So I feel very safe. I'm in a room with techies. I feel like I can. This does look like it's on. No. Maybe a little closer. Okay. We'll adjust. Yes, it's working. Oh, yeah. It is. Okay, you can hear me. Christine's the Assistant Director for Institutional Equity. I am. Good afternoon. Good, how are you? So it's a little intimidating talking about technology in this room, especially since uh, I am not uh, what you'd call advanced in that area, but and I know some of you, and you know that. Jeff sitting in the back. Um, but I can talk about the law, I can do that. So we will do that for a couple minutes and uh, hopefully um, Mike can talk about the policy a little bit. Karen's here to answer some questions um, and, and we'll go from there and we're all good. We're not gonna shut down, so. Um, web accessibility, how many of you feel like you kind of have a good handle on what the law says as opposed to what our policy says? A couple of you. Oh, many of you. Okay. Well, then I can really talk fast and breeze through this. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick overview, and if you have specific questions, I'll try to hurry and we can get to those. The statutes involved um, in web accessibility, um, kind of the legal overview, are the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act. We're covered under both um, as the institution of higher ed, we're public, uh, we're covered by Title II of the ADA, Title I covers employment, Title III public accommodations. Um, Title II is really the provision that says we need to uh, make sure that our programs and services are accessible. Uh, the Rehabilitation Act um, really mirrors um, Title II. We were covered uh, by that prior to the ADA, passed in 1990. Um, the ADA's 20th anniversary is this year. Uh, so what do these statutes require? What do they say? Um, both really, you know, specifically with regard to what we're talking about, web accessibility, um, the statutes talk about providing uh, qualified individuals with disabilities um, equal access to programs and services, unless doing so would constitute a fundamental alteration. As you can guess, there's lots and lots of case law around uh, what fundamental alteration means, um, what equal access means, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's kind of the broad dictate, um, equal access. Okay, so what about websites? Um, does this requirement cover websites? And we have a great answer, which is probably <laughs> no definitive answers yet, lots of indications, a great legal answer. Um, and it's true, we, we really, it's a, it's a developing area. Um, a lot of times the law kind of is trying to play catch up in technology with, with respect to where technology is concerned. And um, I think that's where we are. We have a good um, set of standards, as you know, under 508. Um, with respect to the specific statutes that we're, we're covered by, um, we don't have a specific requirement yet that says yes, you are, you know, we're talking about your websites in particular. Um, just this kind of broader equal access to programs and services. Um, so what are the indications that we are seeing that make us think we better get out ahead of the game and make sure that we are accessible um, with respect to the web? Um, one of them is the Office of Civil Rights. Anyone familiar with Office of Civil Rights? Um, that is the group within the Department of Education who would come to campus if there was a complaint, an issue, um, someone raised with respect to our website um, not being accessible, they would be the body who would come and investigate and make a determination. Um, and they have done this in a lot of other campuses, not here yet, um, but a lot of other campuses where they've issued um, guidance, some uh, guidance in terms of their language they use in the settlement agreements, um, so we have some indication from the Office of Civil Rights that yes, we actually consider the web as part of that program and service we're talking about and the accessibility requirements in Title II um, apply to you, higher ed. 
um, equal access with respect to communication. Title II actually, in its regulations, uses the term, um, it, it specifically talks about communication and it uses the term um, communication must be as effective as communication with others, and I have the site there. Um, what the OCR has done is spent a lot of time talking about kind of what this means, what equally effective communication is, um, and I have some bullet points uh, on the next slide. What do they consider equally effective or as effective? Um, they look at timeliness, accuracy, um, provision in a manner and medium appropriate to the significance of the message, flexibility, comparable burden, audience will have a variety of needs that should be considered. Those are factors we have to look to to say, you know, what would the OCR, if they came here, what would they be asking about? What would they be looking for? And it kind of goes back to, if you remember when this policy was rolled out, we kind of talked about um, the difference between providing um, alternative um, format, alternative material, as opposed to making the website accessible. And um, what the OCR has said is, you know, we don't, first of all, we don't want to see you accommodate um, case by case. We want to see you make uh, the web basically accessible or in a broader context accessible, not um, simply waiting for the response or the request to come to us. Um, as higher ed and then to respond to each one of those on a case by case. They're saying, you know, the timeliness, the accuracy, if um, something is on our website that is for a student to, you know, or a potential student to look at and to make a determination about whether or not they want to come here, take that course, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if they don't have access to that, if they're visually impaired or whatever the case may be, if they don't have access to that in the same way that others do, right, 24-7, in the comfort of their own home, the way that we can all do it, um, what the OCR is saying is that's not, um, you know, as effective. Um, so where are we? Um, we have the OCR guidance a little bit, you know, again, it's a, it's a developing kind of thing. We know that that would be the body that would come into uh, at, to Michigan State and, and make the determination about our websites. We also know that the Department of Justice is um, a body that kind of shares that responsibility with um, the OCR in a way, and they have taken the same stand that OCR has. Yes, web accessibility, we're talking about the web as well. Um, in fact, we just received a um, letter of concern from the Department of Justice kind of asking about the Kindle usage and, and um, what we're doing about that. And in that letter, they're very specific. You know, we consider um, technology to be included in our responsibility under the ADA and rehab, the Rehab Act. And um, we're talking about things like um, looking at outside vendors and making sure you as higher ed have purchasing power, making sure that you're having those conversations when you're purchasing to, um, to make sure that outside alternative, you know, sources of software and that kind of thing are accessible as well, not just kind of blaming it on the third party um, software company. So um, lawsuits, what, what's happened? In the context, context of higher ed, we have nothing at this point, basically, no, no real good legal guidance. What happens in a lot of these cases is we settle um, prior to getting that good legal opinion. So we have a couple of, um, oops. <laughs> I'm almost done. Oh no, but we don't have my slide with the jail. That was my favorite <laughs> one. <laughs> that was the best slide, of, the best all. slide of all. Is it going to restart automatically, Jason? Yes. Wherever you are. Will it? All right. Uh, now I can talk really slow until it <laughs> comes up. Um, the lawsuits that we, the, the two big ones that we can talk about in private industry are Target. Anyone heard of the Target lawsuit? Yeah, a lot of you. And um, Southwest Airlines is one that we've also heard of, um, kind of on the flip side, um, actually having a decision out there that kind of insinuates that um, webs aren't, websites, technology, internet is not considered kind of the more brick and mortar um, when we talk about public accommodation, so making that distinction. So an opinion there that you could rely on, but then we have all this other from OCR and the Department of Justice. And then the target lawsuit, of course, was settled, um, but what we know there is um, that uh, that was a lawsuit filed by the National Federation for the Blind. and. What we know there is that um, the court did not um, 
dismissed the lawsuit right away. It allowed the lawsuit to continue past what was called a um, request for a temporary uh, uh, injunction right in the beginning of the lawsuit. And what the court said was, I see enough to, to be able to move on. And uh, so there's some indication there, again, that the court's buying into, yes, the web is considered program and service that you're going to have to make accessible and not going for that brick and mortar distinction at least right away. So we have some guidance from the Target lawsuit and obviously know that Target spent a whole bunch of money on the settlement and, and um, did in fact update their uh, website to make more accessible than it was. Um, I think that the Target lawsuit had something like I think they reviewed the 15 top pages and said something like 287 alt tags were missing and a whole bunch of, so it was, and then they said it was 80% of what was coming up in the screen reader was coming up as gibberish, so it was, um, you know, and there's some fight about exactly what, because they had testimony from some users through the screen reader who said it was fine, other, and it only took an hour to shop. Others were saying they were so frustrated they just, you know, uh, walked away within five minutes. Um, so some distinction there, but interesting lawsuit, something to keep our eye on for the future. Um, and then my, I'm sure you can't see it, but my next slide is web developer liability. So what does this mean for me? So you've talked about the law, I already knew that anyway. <laughs> you talked about, um, we're going to talk about the policy in a minute. Um, what does this mean for the web, the web developers? If we don't follow the policy if we are in running afoul of something. <laughs> um, what does that mean, JL? Just kidding. So um, the really under Title II um, and the Rehabilitation Act, this is a program and service um, requirement. And what that really means, so, so there is individual liability in the employment context. If Mike is a supervisor and I feel like he's discriminating against me because of my disability in Michigan, could I individually name him and potentially, um, you know, uh, win an award from him individually? Yes. In Michigan, the the law has kind of shifted, and there is that potential. That's the employment side under federal law, employment law. That's not the case. It's only Michigan. But when we're talking about Title II and 504, there's no individual liability. That's just, it doesn't happen. And I talked to our attorney, one person in general counsel's office, and she said um, even if it did, there's a great indemnification policy. Um, and I am on tape <laughs> saying that. So um, there, uh, there's really no reason legally to be worried as an individual web developer that you're going to run in a file of the law. Now, could the OCR come in and want to interview you, question you, have you and your supervisor and your whole group really, you know, um, worked through the kind of how did you do this, how did you, sure, that, that could happen, but, you know, at that point it's going to be an entire university kind of thing, not um, really any particular um, unit necessarily, so, because we have the policy to, to help out with kind of the guidance. Um, and my last slide is just, um, and I know I'm probably over, but so what about Section 508? Um, so Section 508, I think it's confusing to people because it's not really, um, it doesn't really govern us, right? So the, those great standards that the Access Board put out promulgated a whole bunch of really specific language that you all speak that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, that is not a binding legal requirement on us as a university. What we've decided to do as a university, which is what the other Big Tens are doing for the most part, is adopting part of Section 508, part of WCAG um, as standards that we can all kind of um, use as a way of speaking the same language about this stuff, getting everyone on the same, you know, uh, uh, um, language about how to move forward, what to, to, how to govern ourselves around what is accessible because, you know, you could spend all day talking about exactly what is accessible. We don't have a lot of great binding guidance, so we look to other good guidance that's out there and that's what we try to do with the policy and um, Mike can talk about that a little bit now.